Two months ago I started a series about the gods of Yu-Gi-Oh, explaining every detail of the story and origins of them and since we already got through the main gods, I thought about making a super cut video about them. So this video is perfect for people who missed a part or for people who are new to this channel. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoy this kind of content and I would appreciate you subscribing this channel. I would love to reach 1000 subscribers this year so I would really appreciate any support I could get from you. But alright, I talked enough for now, enjoy this video. <laughs> Ishizu Ishta introduced us to the iconic Egyptian gods of New Rio, a group of three mighty servants of the pharaoh with godly powers. We all know how strong the god gods were, at least in the anime and manga. But this video is not about the differences between the TCG cards of the gods and the anime versions of them. Gods of Yu Gi Oh! shall be a series where I talk about the lore of the gods in Yu Gi Oh! How strong are they? What did they do? What did they get used for? And what is the deeper meaning behind them? And what would be a better start to the Gods of Yu Gi Oh! series than the iconic dragon of the sky named Slifer? Well, Slifer isn't even the real name. It got localized as Slifer for some reason, but the real name is Osiris, the Saint Dragon. Osiris is a reference to a real Egyptian god with the same name. While our Osiris was the god of life and death, Yu Gi Oh!'s Osiris was the god of good and evil, which makes it a perfect fit for Atem who was always the middle between two polar opposites. And for example, the Millennium Puzzle was also the only Millennium item that is possessed by good and evil. Besides of just being the god of good and evil, he also is the god of heaven, hence his name being the Sky Dragon. Being the god of the sky, he naturally comes with weather changing abilities, turning a clean sky into the darkest one howling thunderstorms. Osiris uses blasts of lightning to either weaken his enemies or to demolish them with his unlimited potential. And we learned in the final arc against Bakura that Osiris grows stronger when he is in the sky. Since Pegasus converted the text from the ancient stones of the Egyptian gods into a card game, he definitely had to make some changes. I am pretty sure that the ancient stones never said anything about having cards in your hand or having monsters on the opponent's field. So what could Osiris' true power be? The power to decrease the opponent's monster attack and defense points by 2000 could be the intimidating aura Osiris possesses. As soon as Stoll, one of Marek's rare hunters, summoned Osiris in the duel against Artem, the pharaoh himself started shaking and doubting himself, giving up in front of God and losing if Kaiba wouldn't have encouraged him back up. One problem with it is that Artem stated Obelisk's aura to be even more intimidating than that whenever he fought Kaiba in Battle City. And Obelisk doesn't have an effect like that, so that probably wasn't where his ability comes from. A fact we got to know was that Osiris is the swiftest of the gods, and Bakura talked multiple times about the speed of Osiris. So maybe his high speed was something that makes other beings look weaker or anything like that, which made Pegasus create the effect that the enemy monsters lose 2000 points. I couldn't name another option, so feel free to tell me your opinion in the comments below. The other ability of raising Osiris' points by 1000 times the cards in your hand could be derived from multiple things. Be it that the amount of cards in your hand resemble the hate that the sky dragon rises, which will strengthen his powers, or that we go typical Yu-Gi-Oh fashion and it resembles the power of bonding together with everyone. This would fit to Atem, but I think that the first option is more likely. The higher Osiris gets into the sky, the more attack potency he gets. The more cards you have in your hand, the more attack potency he gets. I think it's this road. Osiris also showed the power to emit a light that shows you visions of the past together with Obelisk whenever they were clashing each other. And the last thing I could name for his powers is that he was even able to change the sky without being summoned. In the duel against Bakura in Battle City, Artem drew the god card and at the same moment thunderstorms came out of nowhere, representing the godly powers Osiris emits even without being summoned. Besides that, he has some special attributes that are shared with the other gods, like being immune to magic and monsters below the tier of gods. And that's all what I had to say. An ancient god that controlled the skies and served the pharaoh, who gets sealed into stone tablets, being found some millennia later by Pegasus and created into a dual monsters card. 
Pegasus scared the power of the gods but didn't dare to destroy these cards and ended up getting them sealed in Egypt. Osiris later on got kidnapped by Marek who gave it to Dol for his duel against Yugi. That's when Yugi got in control of that card and used it in several duels throughout Battle City. Ending up being released after the final duel together with the Pharaoh which ends the storyline of Osiris. Obelisk the Tormentor, the giant god soldier, god of destruction and god of the earth. One of the most beloved cards of Yu-Gi-Oh due to being Kaiba's second ace monster and a huge icon for strength. Be it how much Obelisk was utilized by the likes of Atem in ancient times, Kaiba in present times and also being the name for the highest class of duelists at Duel Academy called Obelisk Blue. But the most shocking entrance it probably had was when Kaiba summoned him against Diva in the Dark Side of Dimensions movie. It played at a time where Egyptian god cards didn't even exist, but Kaiba was still able to summon the literal god from the past to support him in that duel. Before we get to the powers of Obelisk, let us get to the namesake first. Unlike Osiris or Ra, who were named after ancient Egyptian gods, Obelisk is named by an important monument of ancient Egypt. Obelisks were four-sided pillars with pyramid-shaped tips that were typically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. These pillars symbolize the sun god Ra or are more like a representation of Ra's rays of light showing off eternity and immortality. A connection that makes a lot of sense if you compare it to Yu-Gi-Oh's Ra who stands above the other two gods. Obelisks were also believed to connect the heaven to the earth which would also kinda give Obelisk a connection to Osiris who is known as the god of the sky in Yu-Gi-Oh. Now to determine the powers of Obelisk is a bit more difficult than for Osiris since we never got any outstanding statements or anything like that. Obelisk always pulled up to make a big punch to destroy anything in its way, hence the name God of Destruction. If we go by his dual monsters effects you shall sacrifice two bodies to God of Obelisk to destroy all monsters on the field and to damage your opponent. By the rules of dual monsters it was interpreted as you dealing 4000 points of damage to your opponent to defeat them instantly and to raise Obelisk's attack to infinity whenever you tribute two monsters. We sadly never saw in the Millennium World arc how two cars or other beings would have been sacrificed for Obelisk. So we don't know if he would actually instant kill anyone in front of him afterwards. But he was already able to drain Thief King Bakura of most of his bar whenever he hit his deer bone and that without having the boost of any sacrifices. The most insane shot we saw of him was when Zorg Necrophades talked about the past events where we saw him with an army of cars against just one obelisk who seemed colossal in comparison. So maybe that was the point where sacrifices has been made to stop Zorg from his plans. But we just don't know. There's one big interesting detail about Obelisk the Tormentor you probably didn't know about and it has something to do with his design. If you compare the dual monsters Obelisk to the actual physical spirit of Obelisk in the Millennium Arc or the Ducks of Dimensions you will see that their designs differ in some way. The actual physical spirit of Obelisk got some markings on his chest and head. That's where the Yu-Gi-Oh R manga comes to play. Even though it's questionable how canon that manga is to the story, there's one interesting thing going on there. That manga plays after Battle City and before the Millennium World arc, meaning that Atem has all three Egyptian god cards. He summoned Obelisk in a duel against someone using evil gods that were on the same hierarchy level as Ra, meaning that Obelisk couldn't harm them. But Atem activated a spell card called Divine Evolution, which would raise Obelisk into a higher hierarchy rank. And whenever that happened, Obelisk the Tormentor turned into Obelisk the Progenitor with those dark markings on him. Which could mean that Obelisk with those markings could just be on the same hierarchy level as a dual monsters version of Ra, which is kinda insane to think about. Anyways, that's it for its powers. Obelisk being an ancient god soldier of earth and destruction, getting sealed into a stone slab and being multiple thousands of years later on revived as a dual monsters card by Pegasus. Pegasus thought about destroying the god cards but he didn't dare to do so and let them be sealed in Egypt. After learning from Merrick's plans 
to get all the Egyptian God cards, Ishiza was able to protect the Obelisk card right on time and used it later on to start Battle City through Kaiba, giving him that card. Kaiba later on lost that card to Yugi in an epic battle and at the end the God cards went together with Artem away from the present world. That was until Kaiba connected to the ancient memories to summon the God of Obelisk himself against Diva to fight him off. And that is the short story about everything we know about Obelisk the Tormentor. The strongest of the Egyptian gods, the winged dragon of Ra, known as the god of the sun and also called the hawk with the wings of the sun. The latest of the three Egyptian gods we got to know that was also introduced to us by Ishizu alongside Osiris and Obelisk. Every one of those gods represent the polarities of the universe. Obelisk represented light and dark and Osiris represented good and evil, while Ra was representing heaven and earth. An interesting connection there is that real obelisks used to represent Ra's rays of light that connect the heaven to earth. Like the other two gods, Ra was also inspired by an ancient Egyptian god who goes by the same name but can also be called Re. The sun itself was believed to be a god instead of being something made by a god. So Ra would have been called the most important god of them all, since the sun is what gives life to earth. Ra was hailed as the sun of the day, while Atum, the primordial Egyptian god was hailed as the sun of the evening. Ra had such a high standing being compared to the primordial god and that's something we also saw in Yu-Gi-Oh. The pharaoh Atem, which is another way of saying Atum, has been compared with the sun god Ra who shined with the light of hope which ties greatly into the real ancient Egyptian connection. The pharaohs were also called the sons of Ra, which also shows how important that god was. During night time, the sun god Ra would go through the afterworld, thus letting darkness arise at night. Ra would resurrect during the morning, explaining not just the sunrise, but also why Yu-Gi-Oh's Ra was so closely connected to Monster Reborn all the time. This just goes to show how many thoughts were put into the Ra of Yu-Gi-Oh and how many references you can pull from ancient Egyptian mythologies. But with that out of the way, let's get to the powers of the winged dragon of Ra. Ra was so special that its effects have been written in hieratic texts. Pegasus wasn't able to translate it over, which is why he copied the literal hieratic text onto that card. An interesting fact is that those hieratic texts won't show themselves before Ra gets summoned. The basic card just displayed question marks on it, but as soon as Ra's rays of sunlight would shine upon the card, the hieratic texts would become visible to read. Kaiba was able to read the texts on that card and translated us what exactly is written on it. The first power of Ra describes how Ra shall take power from free sacrifices, but it would only answer to those who speak the sacred words written on it, even if Ra likes the offerings it got. This represents Ra's Bakugan state whenever it gets summoned through free tributes. No matter who summons Ra that way, the only one who can understand and speak those erotic texts is allowed to take control of the god. That was shown in the duel between Marek and Mai. The second power of Ra states that when the means of resurrection are granted to it, Ra shall come forth from the earth and those who face the god in war shall be incinerated in flames. This represents the second effect that allows Ra to attack on the same turn as it was special summoned, which was not allowed in Battle City. This also includes the power to fuse yourself with Ra, giving the god attack and defense equal to your life points minus one, and also to attack every monster your opponent controls. That for example has been shown in the duel between Marek and Bakura, where Marek demonstrated the infamous one turn kill ability of Ra. The third power of Ra states that it shall become a phoenix in an instant and that the enemies of Ra shall return to the earth. This represents Ra's Phoenix mode, which allows it to destroy every monster by simply paying 1000 of your life points. That had been shown at Marek's duel against Joey. Kaiba goes so far and calls the abilities of the Sun God so terrifying that they surpass mortal thoughts. Ra was also the example for showing that disrespecting the gods can lead to death. Ra was the only god card with so many counterfeit copies and whenever someone tried to use them they would lose their minds, get crippled or even die by doing that. And to end the power section, in ancient Egypt Ra's presence was resembling the sun, turning nighttime into a bright day. 
and the God Phoenix mode that also exists, which would burn the enemies into nothing but ashes that would scatter in hell. That is everything which makes Ra the strongest of the Egyptian gods. But there's another interesting fact. In the obelisk video we talked about obelisk having a true form in obelisk the progenitor, which was on a way higher power level since it transcended into the same hierarchy rank as Ra. That made him immune to anything below his hierarchy rank, which would be anything that isn't Ra or the evil gods. But it seems like the same could go for Ra. The main difference between obelisk the tormentor and obelisk the progenitor was the design differences the ancient Egyptian version being the progenitor. If we look at a side by side comparison of Ra from ancient Egypt and the current time Ra, we can see some clear differences, especially in the face. While the current Ra looks the way we all know it, the ancient Egyptian one kinda looks like a cyber chicken. And beyond that, their phoenix modes also look different. The current Phoenix Ra has a lot of swirly patterns going around it, while the ancient Egyptian Phoenix Ra is more clean with the flames. If we apply the same logic here as with Obelisk, that would mean that this ancient Egyptian Ra should be on an even higher hierarchy rank that surpasses anything we have seen before. And I think that would really fit to the strongest Egyptian god. And that shall be it for this video. Ra was exactly like Osiris and Obelisk, a god that supported the pharaoh in ancient Egypt and was sealed into a stone slab. Pegasus finds some remnants about Ra which he couldn't decipher, thus just copying the heretic texts onto the card he made. Because he couldn't dare to destroy the Egyptian god cards, he let them get sealed in Egypt. That is how Marik got his hands on Ra, which he hauled on to until he got defeated and gave it to the pharaoh. After Atem lost to Yugi, he left the current world and the god cards have not been found since. And a little fun fact, while Atem used all god cards at the same time against Yugi in the anime, he never used Ra once in a duel if we go by the manga. Which is an interesting thing to think about. <laughs> Horakti, the god of light, also called the ultimate god and the creator, is the final piece of the main Egyptian gods we know and love, as it is the literal fusion of the three gods Obelisk, Ra and Osiris. She is the mightiest of them as the ultimate god, but we didn't get to learn or see much of her. She appeared for like 5 pages in the manga or 3 minutes in the anime, so this could be quite a short part for Horakti. Anyways, let's start with the ancient Egyptian influences for Horakti, which is the hardest part to determine. She doesn't have a straight up origin, where we can pull a lot of references like with the other three gods. Ra Horakti is a title in ancient Egyptian mythology that means as much as Ra who is Horus of the two horizons, which simply refers to the sun's journey from horizon to horizon as Ra. We can at least take the name from there, but since Ra is already a deity in Yu-Gi-Oh! and also part of the requirements to summon Horakti, I am doubting that the should really symbolize her. What I can see is that Horakti could be a mix of multiple ancient Egyptian deities, be it Hathor, who in some myths helped producing the world itself with Artum or Artem, who was the creator god, which will support her title as the creator. Hathor also played multiple roles as the feminine counterpart or mother of Ra, which would fit with Horakti's design, and she was the symbolic mother of the pharaohs, all things that fit Horakti in my opinion. But Ra and Atem themselves fit greatly as reference for Horakti, being rulers and creators of all existence while Atem needed to know his name to summon out Horakti in first place. And they were also combined somehow, Ra was merged with Horus as Ra Horakti, while also getting combined with Atem at some point. They all are somehow one while also being separate beings. It is just a very complex topic, at least it is a bit too complex for me. But we can at least say that Ra Horakti is the namesake for her, while she probably has a lot of influences from Hafer, Ra and Atem. Yu-Gi-Oh's Horakti is an enormous goddess who easily destroyed Zorg, who was overpowering the Egyptian gods and anything else without any problems. She finished Zorg off with the sublime light Jezeru, Jezeru meaning holy, the incarnation of darkness getting one-shotted by the holiest of lights. Horakti also seems to be all-knowing, since she knew exactly what was going on, that Atem's name was lost and dispelled to push back the shadows while his friends were the key to truly defeat it and break that 3000 year old seal. 
Informations that weren't told whenever Horakti was summoned. This would also support her title as the ultimate god. And that is probably already everything I am able to say about her. As soon as the pharaoh learned his name from his friends, he was able to call forth the Egyptian gods of the sun, heaven and earth as an Ra, Osiris and Obelisk by fusing them together in the name of the king. As the living embodiment of the gods, he was able to do so as soon as he learned his name. Names are things that also hold a great power in ancient Egyptian mythology, which makes that reference so powerful. The gods fuse together into the ultimate creator god of light, Horakti, who erases the great evil god Zork, saying that strength doesn't come from one single person, but the unity of friends instead, leaving afterwards already. That is the whole story of Horakti we got to see. A little interesting fact that shows how she is above the other Egyptian gods is that her OCG card version doesn't share the divine beast type with the other three gods. She is a creator god instead, which kinda makes her even the top of the card game if you wanna interpret it this way. Anyways, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and that you were able to learn something new. If that was the case then don't forget to subscribe for more interesting Yu-Gi-Oh content in future and like this video to give out some love and support so we can also gain the strength to defeat the darkness. Thank you for watching, have a great day and we see us in my next video. Bye!